Hello, I'm Rob Forsyth. Welcome to Liberalism in Question. In this half-hour podcast from the Centre for Independent Studies, we explore questions and challenges to liberalism today. My guest today is Professor Ian Harper, a member of the Reserve Bank Board and Dean of the Melbourne Business School. Ian Harper, welcome to the program. Thanks, Rob. Nice to be with you. Ian, what do you take liberalism to be? Liberalism is about freedom, uh, Rob. Freedom to to think, freedom of conscience, freedom to act uh, within limits, but, but the essence of liberalism is freedom. What's... Uh, and I take it you are a supporter of liberalism. You're not merely reporting on it. You are a supporter of this way of organising yes, society. Yes, absolutely. And I'm a supporter of liberalism. That is to say that, again, I very strongly support people's freedom of conscience and freedom of thought. Uh, I also obviously support freedom of movement and action, uh, but within, you know, broad limits. Perhaps I should mention that you're talking to me today from Melbourne uh, during uh, one of the strictest lockdowns in the world, I suspect. Yeah. So that's a, that's a restriction on movement. Well, there's no doubt about that, Rob. It is a restriction on movement. And, and you know, I'm, I wouldn't be alone in, in thinking through exactly what that, how, how you trade that off. I and mean, I, I don't like being locked down as much as anybody else does. Or, but um, uh, there is a broader public good here that's being served. At least that's what we're hoping is the case. Uh, and I'm pleased to see the numbers come down. But I think that, um, so there's two points there. The, the first is that, yes, I do accept a case for restrictions on, on liberty, in this case, freedom of movement, as you point out, uh, but that those restrictions should be minimal and they should be, if they're there, removed as soon as at all possible, uh, because the primary good here is, uh, is liberty of movement and action and thought. And, and, and economic activity? You are an economist, aren't uh, Yes, all. I'm an economist, yeah. Well, so when I say uh, freedom of action, I guess that's a wide spectrum there. I, I would certainly include the freedom to buy and sell, uh, to truck and trade, as Adam Smith used to refer to it as. And, um, you know, he used to use the phrase laissez-faire, laissez-aller, that to uh, let things go or let things be. In other words, the sort of base presumption here is that economic activity should be free. Um, and there are arguments when you might want to restrict it, but it, it ought to be free unless those arguments can be made to hold to restrict it. Am I right that, as you understand it, liberalism is as much, well, I'm going to say prejudice, a, 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 I'll use the word prejudice, a, a commitment, a priori commitment to where possible freedom hmm. rather than a strict doctrine? Well, I think so. That, that's almost, you know, innate in the term liberal itself, that, that, that you're, you're wanting to be flexible and open. You're not wanting to be doctrinaire or rigid. Uh, and as a liberal, I'm somebody who gives the presumption, if you like, in favour or presumption of innocence uh, to freedom, that that is the primary good. But um, as Edmund Burke, who was a conservative, as it turned out, but he did point out that, you know, these things need to be within um, constraints because uh, sometimes there is a greater good to be served uh, that, um, that may cut across liberalism or liberal ideas for, for a time anyway. You're not a libertarian in that sense. No, I've, I've, I've not been a libertarian. I mean, I have many friends who are, and I respect their position. But um, no, I, I don't subscribe to libertarianism, but certainly small L liberalism, that's for sure. Now, Mike, I, now, I'm going to ask shortly what are the alternatives and how do you think it's going, but can I ask you why you subscribe to it? Well, I'm going to give you an answer that's based in my religious conviction uh, Rob, I'm a Christian by faith and um, by conviction, and one of the teachings of the Christian church, uh, drawn, I might add, from its Judaic uh, roots, is that each and every human being is made in the image of God. And uh, Christians believe, as do Jews, that uh, God is, of course, perfectly free, unconstrained, completely free to um, achieve God's will. And uh, that we are made in his image, again, gives a, a presumption that that as aspect of godness uh, is conferred on us. And so, you know, human beings uh, ought to be free in order to determine the good and, in fact, of course, to walk away from the good uh, if that's what happens. But that's an essence of their uh, self-determinism under God that I believe very strongly in. So I see a strong conformity there. The fact that people are made, in my view, 
in God's image gives them an innate freedom uh, which needs to be respected and protected, in my view, at all costs. That's a very interesting answer, one I didn't expect. <laughs> now, does that mean that you are a liberal because of your Christian faith, or did you come to, did, were you a liberal before? Oh, uh, well, that, that's my particular story, I guess. I, I was uh, a liberal. I had that, that outlook or that mindset, if you like, prior to my becoming a Christian convert, which I did uh, in adult life, and um, anybody who's interested, you know, I've written that down in a book, so it's not as if it's a state secret. Um, and, and I suppose, you know, when I, when I came to my faith conviction, uh, that did cause me to revisit quite a number of things that I'd taken as read, in particular in my profession, as you say, as an economist. But I came out of that uh, time, Rob, convinced, if anything, of, of what I've just pointed out to you, that there was a strong conformity. I don't think it's ex, ex post rationalization. Most unkind critics of mine may uh, may draw that conclusion. I don't think that's the case. But I, I'm going to say that I became um, affirmed, reaffirmed in my conviction of the importance of the freedom of individuals uh, as I learned more and more about the roots of my own faith and religion. That's very interesting. I, I don't spend too much time on this, uh, mm. but it's an important question. Um, it could be said by some that liberalism only arose in the West when the power of the church was, where the power of the church certainly was limited, mm. and that um, for many centuries, uh, church dominant societies were not liberal societies. Yeah, I think that's a fair criticism, and I, I, I think that um, uh, there's a lot of history there to to get your head around. Uh, and there are clear instances where you'd have to say that the supremacy of the church, where it had a very strong influence over society, uh, was anti-liberal or illiberal, let's say, uh, and doctrinaire. Uh, I, I would accept that criticism. My own view is that there is uh, often a gulf, tragically, uh, between what I take to be the tenets of the Christian faith uh, and the practice of the church. Um, it's not a gulf which is sort of always there. It waxes and wanes. But but at the end of the day, my faith is in the in the God of the Bible as revealed in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, the church has been ordained, as you well know, uh, by Christ and has a particular relationship to Christ within the Christian tradition. Mm -hmm. But um, the church, bluntly, is is full of fallen sinners like me. So, and the church so you. So, in fact, in fact, you're saying that that Tourette, from your point of view, that tyrannical or oppressive or dominant role in society was, was in fact, in some sense, in contradiction to the teachings of the Christian church, as you understand well, them. Well, yeah, exactly. The teachings of the Bible, that's for sure. Yeah. But just in, in pursuing that, uh, just one piece further, Rob, um, some listeners may well be aware of a book by a man called Larry Seidentop, an Oxford um, don, uh, who wrote a wonderful book on, on the... Um, uh, on the individual, on the origins of this notion of individuality and freedom that we have. Uh, and he uh, advances a very detailed thesis for those who are interested over against the position that you were putting, that the church has stood for illiberalism. Uh, in many respects, it's the freedom of the individual and this idea of the uh, imago dei that we're made in God's image that has infused notions of individuality, liberality and freedom uh, down the ages rather than standing against it. I don't know whether you're familiar with the work of Tom, of the historian Tom Holland and his book Dominion. Uh, I am, actually. I, I can't claim to have read it. No, but well, I he, well, his thesis, his thesis, a provocative one, is that, in fact, almost everything that makes the West what it is, including liberalism, has its deep origins in Christianity, yeah. even if those who believe it thinks Christianity is rubbish, but they, they cannot help but being heirs of that tradition. I think and that's that, right. And, and, yeah, and, uh, that's a very provocative thesis, but one that's quite challenging. Well, it is, and and it, it, there's you know echoes of the same notion in Greg Sheridan's recent work for those a bit closer to home, uh, and I, I think it's all too easy. Well, it, in many ways, it's a false dichotomy. People putting, if I can say, secular liberalism over against the church and religion. I think that is a false dichotomy, uh, and um, which isn't to say, as you point out, that the church hasn't behaved abominably and illiberally at different points in its history and maybe even today in certain contexts. One of the provocative outcomes of, of uh, Holland's work is that whereas liberalism can be thought to be somehow natural and rational, he argues it's contingent upon a certain cultural context and tradition mm. and that therefore the thought that if only we could help the world 
see reason that all become liberal is actually a mistake. Do, do, you, do you agree with that? Yeah, I, I, I have a lot of sympathy with that. I used to hold to that view. Um, and I think that the liberalism is a delicate flower, uh, that the natural state of, of humankind, somebody else said this, I can't quite recall whom, but uh, the natural state of humankind is tyranny. And, and you know, from a Christian or, or a biblical or religious perspective, uh, we would say that there are the powers and the authorities in the world um, and that the powers and the authorities are, are opposed to God. Uh, and those powers and authorities are essentially, you know, worshipping the exercise of worldly power. Uh, and, and that is the natural state of the world. Uh, the gospel, the Christian gospel, uh, is a gospel of love to release us from that power. That's another story, Rob. But, but again, it, it's part of, it's, it's where I see the conformity in the two, that, that to be a liberal, to really value the freedom of, of individual conscience and individual action um, is something which, which places the individual, whoever we happen to be, at, at the centre of this, uh, not breaking people up into different constituencies by race or creed or background or age or skin colour or whatever, uh, but by the fact that each and every one is made in God's image and is therefore deserving of respect and deserving to have their autonomy respected. Uh, that's where I'm coming from. Um, uh, this is... Liberalism in Question, I'm Rob Forsyth, and my guest today is Professor Ian Harper from Melbourne and the Reserve Bank Board. Uh, Ian, I, I want to move off this topic in just a moment, but, but I'm rather surprised. I think most people with regard clerics and other notables in the church and, and other places, when they talk economics and politics, tend to speak not liberalism, but much more concern for greater state engagement and uh, often are suspicious of the individualism or liberalism. Have you found that? And if so, what, why do you think that's true if, if what you believe is true? Well, I have found that, Rob, and, but, but it's, not, it's not uniquely true. Really. It has to be said that there are uh, many Christians, as I've discovered, who have um, a suspicion of the, of the power of the state uh, and plenty of examples where the power of the state has been ill-used, most especially against individual Christians and let alone the church. But, the, but there is running through uh, the church and through Christian teaching and through the teaching of Christ himself, uh, as you would know, a strong emphasis on community and relationship. Uh, so, yes, we are individuals, but, but you know, the, the, the answer to um, what was supposed to be a, um, a question, you know, <laughs> a rhetorical question that the, that the prodigal son's elder brother asks, you know, am I my brother's keeper? when challenged by his father. Uh, the answer to that question implicitly is yes, you are. Now, now, not in a way that you would constrain what your brother's doing, but that you would have a very high regard for your brother and for his welfare. In that context of that story, I'm using brother, obviously it's meant much more broadly than that. And I think that, that where the church gets a bit hung up then is to think, well, the only way that we can be caring for one another in relationship, in community, uh, caring for one another's welfare, we're being one another's keepers, if you like, is to impose that literal uh, keeper status, that we have the power of the state to ensure that you are kept in line. Uh, I don't think that's what the teaching is about at all. Uh, for me to have, to, to see you as my brother, so to speak, uh, means that, that I have a, such a close concern for your welfare, it's as close as my own. It's, it's you know, lo 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 love, us, love one another, right, as, as, we, as we love ourselves. And, and so that, it's my desire for my own freedom of conscience, my own freedom of movement, my own freedom to self-determine, which would want me to, want to have the same for you, right, and for us in, a, in life and community. But, but, the, but, but Ian Harper, you, you, you know, in fact, you're, you know very well that that's not the way society is working mm -hmm. and that there is a great deal of uh, freedom can be used for exploitation, yeah. um, can control of others. I, can I give you a quote from uh, just a recent comment you made? Mm -hmm. I think reflecting back upon the Banking Royal Commission and subsequent revelations, um, you, firstly, you said, reg I quote, regulation is a poor substitute for culturally embedded moral restraint. Yeah. Would you explain what you meant by that? Oh, well, uh, <laughs> if, if you haven't got people's hearts and minds, if they don't have any, anything internal which would lead them to make 
um, to do the right, right, to make the right decisions and to avoid uh, self-serving behaviour, let alone destructive behaviour of others. If there's nothing internal, Rob, then then you can design all the laws and restraints you like. Uh, they will be undermined uh, because, of course, the limits to human ingenuity are uh, non-existent. People will find a way through. In fact, that's the next sentence you make. It, it may be, you, you may call it a poor substitute, but you then go on to say, and I quote, but yeah. when the latter is non-existent, yeah. that is moral restraint, regulation may be necessary yeah. to secure the public interest against the worst excesses of self-serving behaviour by those in position of trust. It sounds well, like you've been a bit disillusioned by what you've discovered. Well, well, uh, well I have walked that road, uh, Rob. I have. I mean, I, I had the privilege of being a member of the Wallace Committee uh, in this country in the mid-1990s. People might remember the younger members of the audience, so listeners probably won't, but it was a committee that was charged with uh, coming up with a regulatory framework for our financial institutions. And I'm proud to say that that framework, at least, um, is still in existence. And the framework has survived uh, two royal commissions and two subsequent inquiries. So no one's found fault with the framework. Uh, but when we set it in place, you know, what we believed effectively that you know, sunlight is the best disinfectant, as they say, that the disclosure, the revelation, doing these things in the open would induce people uh, to make decisions that were the right decisions, just for fear of being discovered uh, of, for doing the wrong thing. Now, whether the disclosure can't work or didn't work, uh, you know, that it depends on the individual circumstances, but, it's, but what's completely clear uh, all of these years later, you know, when we had the Hain Royal Commission is that notwithstanding the sort of things that my, I and my colleagues and the government had accepted our advice uh, put in place with regulation in the financial system, that there was still, you know, behaviour that was egregious and, and just, I mean, shameful and, and very painful to hear um, trotted out before the Royal Commissioner. And in those sort of circumstances, you know, I've had to fall back a bit and to sort of, what can I say to someone who says, so you're saying to me that there's no case for any sort of regulatory intervention in the face of that sort of behaviour? Well, I can't sustain that, Rob. I have to say mm. that, yes, there is a case for regulatory intervention, but let's not forget the costs as well as the benefits of that regulatory intervention. And let's all, let, nevertheless, let's give the preference to the regulation free solution, but where it conspicuously gives rise to more costs than the regulated solution does, then, you know, normal cost-benefit analysis would lead you to impose the regulations. This leads, I, I imagine, therefore, to the conclusion that one of the prerequisites for a genuinely liberal society is, in some sense, a society in which there is genuine, culturally embedded moral restraint. Oh, definitely. And, and you know, that's where Justice Hain come out. He talked about values uh, and culture. Which, which is, you know, fair enough. But that's a, that's a very broad term. Uh, I, I would, I'd like to think, talk about, you know, ethics and morals, something much narrower. But those don't tend to be popular terms these days, even though the people I think understand values and culture in the same way. It's the same thing. There needs to be some sort of restraint. Uh, now, here again, Rob, uh, Christian faith comes to the aid of the party because we, we, we know that even in that sort of a world, well, babe, well, more to the point, it's sort of impossible for us as individuals to live by those rules, even if we acknowledge them to be right. Um, you know, for a Christian, that's what sent Jesus Christ to his cross, right? E exactly that. So so there is a, as, as St. Paul says, you know, what <laughs> sort of wretched people we are, but, but you know, thank God for, um, for, for Christ. And, and that's a Christian take on this. But doesn't that mean, um, with that view of human nature, mm. um, that therefore, you, you really can't endorse a genuinely liberal society because you'll know that the requisite moral self-constraint will not be present in sufficient number of people well, to well, allow it to work. Then I think I'd go back to our earlier distinction, Rob. I, I couldn't endorse a libertarian view. I, I can't, or, or you know, anarchist okay. or whatever, I, I can't do that. But, but, where, but I think it's more a case of the presumption. I want to have a presumption in the favour of liberty for the reasons that I think I've, I've tried to explain. In fact, let, let me unpack those reasons a bit further. You talked about a cost. You said we have to sometimes have this regulation yes. necessary to secure the public interest yes. against the worst, worst excesses of self-serving behaviour. But you said also there's a cost. What, what's the cost of that? Well, at one level, the, the cost is actually <laughs> restraining people, right? Because you, you, you can't design these systems in ways that will... Uh, 
um, just restrain the evil behavior. You end up having to sort of restrain everybody, a bit like, you know, everybody having to be kept in uh, after school because of the infractions. Or, 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 or in lockdown, perhaps. Oh, well, indeed, indeed. <laughs> That's a, that, well, maybe it, it, the curfew aspect of what we're experiencing, you know, the Premier, uh, Mr Andrews, has recently sort of more or less admitted that to my mind, that I needed to stop people moving around. And, and, and well, but why can't you just ask people to do that? Well, you can, but they won't stop, right? And therefore, we have to do this on pain of... Does, does, does this restraint also have an economic um, effect? Does it make oh, well, oh, yeah, people yeah. less prosperous? Well, that's quite clear. That's absolutely right. I mean, that's, it's a wonderful, in that sense, or, although um, scarifying, lesson in economics that... that um, where people have to move around and they have to get together <laughs> in able to, to be able to do business. Sure, you can do it online, and that's a, not a bad substitute. Thank goodness we've got that. But at the end of the day, that is not going to return economic activity to the levels it was before because people need to, to be together. And, and does, that, does that principle apply to all, to all regulation, in a sense, then, that when, yes, a, when well, we need to restrain, that in fact... A, yeah, the, economists... The, Economists talk about the excess burden of regulation, right? Yes. Without getting too technical here, effectively what that means is there is an economic cost. Every time a regulation stops, two people engaging in a, a, a trade, which is, you know, illicit, right? And I'm not necessarily talking about, you know, drug yeah, dependence sure. or selling body parts or something, but, <laughs> but you know, illicit trade. Um, whenever a regulation stops that, and they're too blunt not to have some effect like that, uh, then that's an economic cost. Uh, and the same is true of taxes and other forms of intervention. They all have what economists call an excess burden or dead weight cost, call it what you like. And, and that type of cost, which is at its essence, the impact, the economic impact or playing out of a restraint on, on action, on freedom of action, that has to be set off against the benefits, the punitive benefits in terms of stopping the bad behaviour. And, and, and really, I guess where I'm coming from is that, you know, in season and out of season, you need to be doing that calculation and, as necessary, changing the interventions to ensure that you um, keep on the right side of that benefit cost analysis. Can I just lift, come back a slightly bigger picture here? Do you think that belief in liberalism as a good way to organise society is under a bit of a cloud at the moment? Yeah. Well, and I if do. so, why, and why? Why do you think that's so? Well, <laughs> I think that's a very deep question. Uh, let me say that I think that there is uh, the rise of what I would say a, an ugly authoritarian strain. And I'm, I, I, th I think it's got something to do, Rob, with a sense that uh, the we Western liberalism, uh, and partly because people associated with the church and, and religious views, which they regard as either intolerant or having, um, you know, covered up such gross evils as child abuse and such like, that, that there's a blanket suspicion of um, liberalism and the Western tradition and a leaping towards authoritarian solutions, which, which uh, an author, you know, the West has become, you know, has tolerated racism or as a result or has produced racism, has produced a bunch of other things that, you know, transphobia and homophobia and this and that. And, and we need authoritarian interventions to stamp this out. Uh, and we can't allow people just to behave the way they would behave, because if they do, then there'll be rampant racism and such like. For me, my view is that is that, that is a very regrettable turn of events, because it really spins on its head the sorts of things that famous campaigners against racism, like Martin Luther King said, where we want to be completely blind to what the colour of a person's skin, and, and and we're judging by the conduct of character and action. Um, you know, St Paul in the Bible says the same thing. It's There is no Greek or Jew. There is no black or white, male or female. We're all one made in God's image. And at the end of the day, as a Christian, I find that fundamental calling to recognise what we share in our humanity, that's what we share. Then all the other things that divide us ought not to be the things that, that um, you know, organise our society and organise the way we think about the world. In that sense, Rob, I think that there is a great conformity between liberalism and, and a Christian outlook on life. You know, well, well, this raises a, what would have to be, I think, my last, last question, although I'm happy to give time for answer. Yeah. If that's true, mm. and let's assume for the moment, um, 
that the that the impact of the Christian faith and in the Western world and the world so the Western world is 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 a declining waning. Does that mean that liberalism will wane, or can it live on its own, having been launched by this historical phenomenon? Does it have the power to survive without uh, its underpinnings around it anymore? Well, uh, I'm going to say I don't think so, uh, because it's, it's like you're you're cutting off liberalism at its root. Um, even if even if people don't recognise where these ideas have come from or acknowledge the role the church has played, I mean, you know, I'd like to think that they would, but even if they didn't. Uh, what they'll discover is that when you when you cut the root off, and um, the flowers die, and and then I'm very very concerned about about that. Uh, I'd have to say so. You know, I, I would I'd like to think that that as people come to see the 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 lack of well the fact that authoritarianism carries with it a whole lot of things that people will viscerally react against, right? But there will be a resurgence, perhaps not if not in Christian faith, although I'd pray for that outcome. Certainly, a, a resurgence in recognizing the importance of individualism and freedom, uh, and you can see already in you know, a reaction against even the imposition of restraints in Victoria. There's a, a and here else, elsewhere in the world, perhaps even more so, uh, a reaction against this. At our heart, Rob, we want to be free, mate. <laughs> we want to be free. We recognize that needs to be done responsibly, but we want to be free. And I want to affirm that fundamental calling because, for my take, uh, that comes from God. Well, I must say, talking to an economist, I didn't expect to do so much theology. I do appreciate very much your time with us, uh, Ian Harper, the uh, member of the Reserve Bank Board and, of course, Dean of the Melbourne Business School. This has been another podcast of Liberalism in Question from the Centre for Independent Studies. For decades, the CIS has been the independent voice working to deliver evidence-based policy within a classical liberal framework. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our cause. Check out the links on the website to see how you can get involved. I'm Rob Forsyth. Thank you for listening.